I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Last fall, I became a novice in a dispersed religious group in our Episcopal Church called the Community of the Mother of Jesus, or CMJ for short. And to be a brother or sister in the CMJ involves both a contemplative and active aspect of religious life. And normally someone who's drawn to religious life, to be a sister or a brother, is drawn to one or the other primarily. And we think of perhaps cloistered nuns who spend their day in prayer, or uh, the, the nuns, the sisters and brothers who have a teaching ministry or a hospital ministry, primary ministry, is active. But in the CMJ, you know, one of the reasons I was drawn to them so much was, well, first of all, that they are dispersed. We continue to live our, our life in the world, which is very important to me, to continue to be a parish priest. But also that dual focus, uh, praying the office every day and sitting in silence on one hand, and every sister and brother is to have a ministry to those in need in their community. All of that was appealing to me since I first knew about the CMJ back when I was in seminary. But one of the things, when I first learned of them, that uh, kind of took me for a bit of a loop was the name. I said, well, first of all, there's two ofs in there. The community of the mother of Jesus. Kind of clunky. And, you know, everybody knows that Jesus' mother was Mary. So, you know, what, you know why, why are we beating around the bush here? I had completely forgotten, even though I was a seminarian, kind of embarrassing, that in the Gospel of John, Mary's never referred to by name. She's always the mother of Jesus. So it's scripturally inspired. Um, and John does that because he really wants to emphasize a lot of symbolism. In fact, it's St. John who refers to all of Jesus' miracles as signs rather than as miracles. And you know, so for Mary's part, the mother of Jesus, that's because she symbolizes Israel. Uh, she is the mother of our Lord. She is the mother of our faith in the way that the Jewish faith is the mother of Christianity. And it's this very passage, the wedding feast at Cana, that inspired our founder, Brother Stephen, as he was bringing CMJ into being. It's Mary's words in this passage that form the CMJ's motto. Uh, in Latin, of course, to conque dicterit vovis facit, or in English, do whatever he tells you. Simple expression, wonderful for all Christians and for communities, I think particularly for parish churches or for religious communities that aren't focused on a single ministry. You know, do whatever he tells you implies an openness to something new or something different or something unexpected be open to where our Lord leads us. But despite the symbolic narrative that John gives us, uh, unfortunately, this passage has been given short shrift by uh, quite a few people in our, our contemporary time, because they view the passage narrowly only through a historical or the literal. All other modes of communication and truth are far distant. So what does that mean? How does that play out? It could, it could come in a couple of forms. One of them is like this. Someone could say, ah, man, turning water into wine, that's kind of a parlor trick, you know, something magicians do, you know, a sleight of hand. You know, despite, I don't know of many sleight of hands that are using 30-gallon barrels. I mean, that'd be kind of hard to swap out when someone wasn't looking. But, you know, for this kind of critic, even if they accept the story at face value, reading only the literal, they're going to say, okay, so Jesus was God, and this is how your God spent his time? I mean, you know, certainly there were more lepers out there. There were more sick children that needed help. Uh, more wine at a party. And the first of his signs? I mean, this is the biggest priority for your king of kings and lord of lords? Yeah, I'll pass. That's, a, that's a, a kind of critique that really doesn't understand what's going on in the story, but nonetheless, it persists. It sort of takes the flat reading 
accepts what it says, and then rejects it. Another kind of criticism from this worldview is to not even accept the story to begin with. To sort of have this categorical rejection of any kind of miracle as such. They just can't happen by default. And so the story is tantamount to a lie that someone wrote down a long time ago and a bunch of fools believe. That's about all there is to it in the end. Sadly, that kind of perception, that that's all there really is going on in this gospel story, that carries so much cultural cachet that it's even transformed the way that we understand the word myth, what that even is. Uh, the proper definition, Merriam-Webster still lists it first, actually, is this. A usually traditional story of an ostensibly historical event that serves to unfold part of the worldview of a people or to explain a practice or belief or natural phenomenon. In this sense, the wedding of Cana falls into this literary category. It's a traditional story. It's based on ostensibly historical events, the ministry of Jesus and what he did. It informs the worldview of Christians. Do whatever he tells you. How we live our life, it shapes how we see and interact with the world. Unfortunately, this proper literary understanding of myth has been replaced in our modern culture to mean something that's simply factually or scientifically incorrect, and possibly a lot of people believe it. To the point where you could see something up, like an article title somewhere, something like the five biggest myths of weight loss. You know, where's the traditional story? Where's the worldview of the, nothing? It's just, it's equal to saying the five biggest lies of weight loss. I mean, that's myth equals lie. And that's a sad reduction that we've been stuck with based on the, the power and the, of this particular lens that's so widely spread in our culture. Now, St. John, the author of the Gospel, he was no modern rationalist. He understood the events of the wedding feast of Cana story to be historical reports. You know, they were based on what actually happened. But the form of the story as we get it comes to us through his writing under the guidance of his people. And it is grounded in history. History is part of it. I want to say that categorically. But also, notice that the historical reality isn't what St. John stresses. It's there, but that's not the point. It's almost kind of beside the point. For St. John, the sign itself is not central. All the critics miss it. Indeed, for something to even be a sign in the first place, he uses that word on purpose instead of mere. It has to point to something beyond itself. I mean, think of common signs in our culture. A stop sign isn't, hey, look at this red shape. It means something else beyond what itself is. And notice, too, how St. John describes the sign in passing. The steward tasted the water that had become wine. It has sort of already transpired, and he doesn't even note it. And you don't hear about the water getting redder or the taste starting to appear. It just has already happened by the time we even hear about it. It's not described directly, but only in kind. For St. John and for us today, it's the spiritual underlying of the story that he really wants to express. So what is that exactly? Well, there are so many things going on here, but there are two that I lift up. First and foremost, I think it benefits us to focus on that last sentence. That's the climax of the story, what it's all leading up to, kind of the point from St. John's perspective, that through this, Jesus' glory is revealed and his disciples believe in him. The spiritual sense is that the revelation of God's glory brings people to faith. And it doesn't always take the form of a dove bodily descending and a voice booming from heaven. It doesn't always take the form of a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, although it can. Sometimes, sometimes the experience of God's glory can simply be an unexpectedly good glass of wine at a party. That's the sign. 
You know, and, and think of how this adds a little bit more color to the character of our Lord and Savior. You know, we know he was someone who spent time in prayer and, and wrestled with Satan in the wilderness. That wasn't all he was. You know, he was someone who challenged the religious authorities of his day right in their own places of power. But that wasn't all he was. He was also someone who wasn't out of a place at a happy celebration. He was invited to come and, and have some fun, some merrymaking. That was also part of who he was. You know, we can sometimes talk about having this experience of God in unexpected places. This passage shows quite well that it's not unexpected, or shouldn't be, that God reveals himself in a time of celebration and happiness among friends and relatives, even with a drink, uh, just as much as he might reveal himself in silent prayer in a cloistered monastery. For the other symbolic sense, I'd like to return to where I began, with the CMJ and the mother of Jesus by which they take their name. When she told the stewards, do whatever he tells you. That poor chap, I mean, could have been thinking, lady, what does it matter what he tells me? I mean, seriously, unless he brought a whole bunch of wine on those mules he traveled in on, you know, we're up a river here, we're out of wine. What he tells me. But he doesn't argue. Takes Mary at her word to go to her son Jesus. Do what he says. He listens to Jesus, not knowing the why, doing something that doesn't make a whole put some water in these jars. What does that have to do with what's going on right now? But that's what Jesus is telling him, and he does it. And through his obedience to our Lord and Savior, God's glory is revealed, but not to everyone. Not to everyone. To many people there. They just saved some of the best wine for last. They didn't really see it. It was only the stewards who had put the water in, and Mary, of course. In other words, those who listened to Jesus saw him in and through what was going on. And the other passers-by experienced the same thing, but didn't see it, because they weren't listening to Jesus. That's the spiritual sense that St. John is trying to communicate to us in this gospel is what's missed completely by the critics. That's the full sense of the mythic in all of its dimensions in and through our sacred. If anyone ever says to you, why do you bother going to church? Don't you know that those gospels are all a bunch of myths? Tell them, absolutely. I've spoken to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.